Welcome back. Before we begin, we're going to bow our heads for a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your word. We thank you for the opportunity to look into science, the Bible, and truth. And I pray that right now as we look into these things that you would guide, that you would give me the words that you would have me to speak. May they all be done to your glory. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, when we talk about science and when we talk about faith, obviously there, are, there is something that is true science. There is also things that are really just philosophy and theoretical science, which is not necessarily in the realm of what we would say as absolute truth. But the reality is we're going to be looking into this. We've already seen a few different things that uh, have been claimed to be science, but have been discovered to either be fabrications uh, accidental mistakes or otherwise, but the reality is, is many times people put their trust in the scientific establishment as if it were infallible. Now, I know that science would not claim to be infallible because the fact is you should always be pursuing truth, and that's what we're trying to do. But there are some aspects that cannot fit in with the scientific framework in totality in the sense that uh, they cannot be replicated, they cannot be truly tested. And we saw that in, in Hebrews chapter 11, verse 1, the Bible says that faith Faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen. What that means is that if you believe in something that you have never seen, and uh, you know, if you believe in something you've never seen, you simply have faith. So we're looking into both faith and science. Yes, there is true science. Now, evolution, we read, is the process by which different kinds of living organisms are thought to have developed and diversified from earlier forms during the history of the Earth. Obviously, lower life forms became more complex according to the evolutionary theory. The Bible actually teaches that when God made the world, He made the different kinds of creatures. Yes, changes could take place to some capacity, but not becoming totally different kinds of creatures. We go a little bit further, and we talk about different kinds of evolution. Typically, what evolutionists do is they start with an example of microevolution a small change within one kind of uh, species or one kind of animal, a very small change, and then say, look, tiny changes can happen, therefore an amoeba can become a human. They make a giant leap of logic that does not actually fit within the realm of science. Nobody has seen these things happen, so they believe it based upon faith. What is microevolution? Microevolution is the evolutionary change within a species or small group of organisms, especially over a short period of time. Now this fits within the biblical framework that one creature can have small changes within its DNA or these kinds of things that can change maybe its adaptability in a certain circumstance. But that does not mean that because something can change in a given circumstance that it can become a totally different kind of creature. Now the other form of macro is called macroevolution, which is what we t typically think of when we think of evolution. And macroevolution is major evolutionary change. The term applies mainly to the evolution of whole taxonomic groups over long periods of time, meaning one creature becoming a, a total different kind of creature, like an amoeba slowly becoming a fish and slowly coming out of the water and becoming a mammal, you know, at some time, whether that was in the water or out of the water, but nevertheless, finally the tame time came where it became a human being. That would be macroevolution. Now, gradualism is the hypothesis that evolution proceeds chiefly by the accumulation of gradual changes. So, gradualism says that it slowly happened. This was Darwin's perspective. Darwin believed that evolution took place slowly over a long period of time and that it was by slight successive modification. That was his wording. He said it would be through slight successive modifications. But basically, some modern scientists have begin to, begin to look at the history of the world and say there's just not enough time to create the diversity of life upon planet Earth. There's not enough time in the supposed 4.6 billion years of Earth's history, even though the Bible teaches the Earth is much, much shorter. But scientists have looked and said this couldn't happen. So they came up with another theory which is called punctuated equilibrium. Now what is that? A uh, very fancy word, and when you make a fancy word up, it sounds like it probably is true, because why would you make up a word that isn't true? But, now listen, this is once again in the realm of philosophy or religion, because nobody's seen it, but they believe it, or at least some do, not, not by and large, not necessarily. But punctuated equilibrium is the hypothesis that evolutionary development is marked by isolated episodes of rapid speciation between long periods of little or no change. And basically there's kind of the perverse 
proverbial lizard that lays an egg and kind of a bird comes out of it. This is punctuated equilibrium. That might be a little extreme of an example, but basically a great evolutionary change over a very short period of time. Now to me, this and macro evolution, both of them are in the realms of philosophies. Nobody has seen something become come a total different kind of animal, uh, whether over a short period or a long period. Yes, small changes have taken place within a creature, but that doesn't change it into a whole another kind of creature. So we're finding some definitions here, and as we go on with our definitions, now let's look at the def definition of what a missing link would be. Now a missing link is a thing that is needed in order to complete a series, provide continuity, or gain com complete knowledge. And number two, it's a hypothetical, notice that word, a hypothetical fossil from any intermediate between a hypothetical fossil sorry a hypothetical fossil form intermediate between two living forms especially between humans and apes so this is what we're looking at this is going to be the topic of our message now we're going to be look at this supposed missing link so let's press on and look at this now the bible actually says in genesis chapter 1 verse 26 and 27 and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creeps on the earth. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God created he him. Male and female created he them. Now, we have this picture that God created, according to the Bible, God created man in his own image. He was created perfect in the very beginning without any flaw. Obviously, we know that later on that all changed after sin came into the world. But the, the Bible does not give a picture that man slowly evolved from a monkey. Now, I know there are many people who believe that or an ape-like creature, whatever it was. It was some kind of uh, ape-like creature and slowly evolved into a man. The Bible gives a very different perspective. We already saw in Romans chapter 5 and verse 12, wherefore, as by one man, sin entered into the world, and death by sin. The Bible says that death came as a result of sin. Evolution says no. Slowly, countless generations of death have brought about man. Just the opposite. We cannot harmonize these two, but evolutionists say we can prove it. We've been proving it for uh, nearly a century that there have been intermediate forms, uh, creatures that have evolved into human beings. And we've looked a little bit about this, so this one will be a review and we'll press on into other ones. We see here evolution's hall of shame, speaking of the Piltdown Man. Now this is the Piltdown Man here, and for some time, for some 40 years, this man was thought to be in, in basically good standing as one of the intermediaries that became a human, this, this man called Pilt, Piltdown Man. Now what ended up happening with him was basically they discovered, as we've already seen, that this was nothing more than the great Piltdown hoax. They discovered simply that this jawbone of an ape was uh, filed down and put with a human skull cap, and these two were put together, so it was literally half man, half ape. So it actually was half man, half ape, but it was it was no uh, you know, missing link per se. It was nothing but a deception by these men to seemingly perpetuate the theory of evolution because up until that time, they hadn't been able to prove this, you know, that there was you know, man slowly evolved from a monkey. So they came up with a good example to prove it. And notice we actually read about it here. And I, I want you to notice once again how important this is because you and I as children would sit and watch Discovery Channel or, or whatever it may be or we'd read the textbooks and they would speak as if the things you were reading were legitimate facts. Now, keep in mind, there are facts in textbooks, no question. But once they get into the realm of origins, they get into the realm of faith because nobody has ever seen it with their own eye. And so, in the realm of faith, they have come up with things that they speak of as legitimate, factual truth. This is the way they speak. Now, notice what the, the, they ended up discovering many years after finding this so-called Piltdown Man. Careful examination of the bone pieces in 1953 revealed the startling information that the whole thing was a fabrication, a hoax perpetuated by Dawson, probably to achieve recognition. The skulls were collections of pieces, some human and some not. One skull had a human skull cap, but an ape lower jaw. The teeth had been filed and the front of the jaw broken off to obscure the simian or ape origin. 
Some fragments used had been stained to hide the fact that the bones were not fossil but fresh. In drilling into the bones, researchers obtained shavings rather than powder, as would be expected in truly fossilized bone. So once again, total deception. Scientists, uh, but for some time they believed it because they were expecting that would be the case. And when they found it, people didn't really investigate it for some time until finally someone actually went in. And notice how it was spoken of as totally legitimate scientific fact even though it was actually a fabrication. In the newspaper it says Darwin theory is proved true. And once again you can imagine how many people lost their faith because the Darwin theory had been proved true through a fabrication. But people believed it because they believe scientists as if they have no uh, bias whatsoever. But the bias is shown here very clearly and we're going to see more as we press forward. This is what they wrote about it in the New, New York Times December 22, 1912. Darwin theory is proved true. English scientists say the skull found in Sussex establishes human descent from apes thought to be a woman's and the bones illustrate a stage of evolution which has only been imagined before. And it was still only imagined at that time because it was a shame. You see? So it was imagined and it was spoken of as if it was fact even though it was just imagined. And even today it's just imagined and we're going to look more into that as we press forward. The creature could not talk. Notice the things just like when you watch Discovery Channel when you were a child as I may have or many of you have and as, as we watched it we saw these creatures they made. They took a skull and, and they kind of wrapped some flesh around and we said wow that's what it looked like. That's what the ancient man looked like. And we're going to discuss discover that even that's a fabrication, that they can make it look like anything they want, and different artists come up with totally different representations. One looks like a monkey man, one looks like an Eastern European, and it's the same skull. And we're going to look at that as we press forward. But notice they said it couldn't talk. How do they know it couldn't talk? How do they know a human skull cap and an ape lower jawbone couldn't talk? But when they speak, we believe them because they speak authoritatively, right? It goes on to say, probably lived at a time when other species of humans had developed further elsewhere. Let's go on further. It says, London, December 21, a race of ape-like and speechless men inhabiting England hundreds of thousands of years ago when they had for their neighbors the mastodon and other animals, now extinct is the missing link in the chain in man's evolution, which leading scientists say they have discovered in what is generally described as the Sussex skull. So notice, this is the kind of things we read and it sounds so, wow, gripping. Truth must be because they wouldn't they wouldn't be deceitful. Now, not that most of the people were being deceitful, only the originator of it, but then others were propagating it as scientific legitimate fact. And they said, Oh, it couldn't talk. Uh, how did they know that? Good question. So what I've learned is to actually question science. I've actually learned over the years of studying these things that you can actually see through many of the errors in evolutionary speech just by recognizing most of the things they talk about, not in science in general, we're talking in the evolutionary field. Science, yes, there's much truth in the health sciences and even earth science and several different aspects of science, but the reality is there's certain things, especially within the realms of evolution, they're actually just theoretical and uh, basically coming up with ideas and purporting them to be true even though no one has ever seen it. But we already saw that faith is believing in something you have never seen based upon evidence. That is the definition of faith in the Bible. So if someone believes that that's okay, but that is their choice to live by faith in the textbooks of evolution per se. So it says, notice here, it says, speaking of this Sussex skull or Piltdown man, it gives us a stage of evolution of man which we have only imagined since Darwin propounded the theory. But it was still nothing more than a fabrication. But let's go on a little bit further. We're looking at evolution's hall of shame. What about Neanderthal man? What about this Neanderthal? What do we say about this? Well, let's look at this. They say, you know, look at he's, uh, you can tell that he seemingly is kind of growing up from a hunched over position, making his way up to an, you know, an erect man, right? These kind of things. And so we have the charts and the charts say, uh, you know, look at him. You got Lucy over there on the left and he makes his way up to Cro-Magnon man and um, finally he makes him his way up to, you know, human beings. But the interesting thing about this Neanderthal man, he has a 13% larger brain capacity than modern humans. Now, brain ca capacity is not a, a guarantee of being more intelligent per se, but it's interesting that this does not necessarily seem to be some unintelligent creature that they had found. One of the interesting things that I stated earlier is here we have, uh, you know, taken from Time Life books on the Neanderthals, you have nine different examples of what it could look like. You have one guy makes it look, you know, very 
monkey-like, and down on the bottom right it looks more human-like. But we notice this. This is the very same skull here uh, on top and bottom. But notice on the bottom it fully looks like an ape man, what you would imagine an ape man would look like. But notice on the top the brother could be a Euro European. Very same skull. So which one is accurate? See, when you watch Discovery Channel and they showed you that oh, the reconstruction that scientists have brought about through technolo technological advances, and, and we're watching this and we're thinking, wow, that is amazing. That must be exactly what it looked like. But then you realize the whole thing is artistic license. That whatever guy, if you told him this is a skull of a man from the 1400s, he would have made it look like a man from the 1400s. If you say this is a half man, half ape, he's going to make something that looks like a half man, half ape. And the children and the adults and the college student and the high school students are going to sit back because we believe, you know, with absolute faith and the propagators of this theory that what they're showing us must be true. But actually, if you read into it outside of the textbooks, remember the textbooks like to show us one side of the story. And we've already seen that the Bible says in Proverbs chapter 18, verse 17, it talks about the simple fact that the one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. The one who states his case first seems right until the other comes and examines him. So they've stated their case. They've shown us these things from children. We were growing up with the dogma, and we were being taught this as a child, and we didn't see, we never got a chance to see the other side of the story, that actually that picture isn't as legitimate as the Discovery Channel made us think, or the textbooks made us think. If we look into it a little further, we, we find out that any artist can make a skull look like just about anything. And that's just a fact. But let's go forward. Now, if Neanderthal man, this is what we discover, if Neanderthal man could be re reincarnated and placed in a New York subway, provided that he were bathed, shaved, and dressed in mod modern clothing, it is doubtful whether he would attract any more attention than anyone else. Basically, what scientists say is they ac actually look at the skull of what they consider to be the Neanderthal. What they say is that actually that skull looks basically pretty much like a modern human or a different kind of human. Obviously, different human in different parts of the world may look a little different. And they're saying, look, if he, this guy, if you put some skin on this guy, walked him down a suit and, you know, a Wall Street or whatever, he'd probably attract no more attention than anybody else. So seemingly, this guy looks pretty much just normal. Well, one of the aspects is he has a really large brow ridge. And one of the interesting things is, and you, you notice it, I'll bet you have noticed it, huh? That when you, when you see elderly people, as we get older, our brow ridge continues to grow. I mean, we don't generally continue to get taller. We actually start shrinking, you know, hunching anyway, as we get older. But the reality is the brow ridge actually continues to grow. Um, and as it continues to grow, uh, some scientists, or at least some creationists, I should say, have looked at this and said, maybe this is actually just a very old human being. Very well may, may have been that because as we get older, the brow ridge continues to grow. This is probably a, a, a very old person. Some have suggested it could have been someone near 200 years old by the size of the brow ridge, which would fit along with what the Bible says about human beings living much longer before the flood. They lived much longer before the flood. Now let's go further. Let's look at some of the other so-called, you know, cavemen or ape men or whatever you'd like to call them, uh, ancient men. You have the Peking man. What about the Peking man? Well, he was the heavy bone Peking hominid skull, featured prominent brow ridges and somewhat small brain case. And so sm somewhat smaller anyway than modern humans. But the trouble is that all the skulls disappeared during World War II, so we cannot now examine them with modern methods to check their genuineness. So we have no idea what was going on with the Peking man. It's gone, and we're not able to really study it out anymore. So there's nothing really, you can't say much one way or another about this guy. But let's go on and look at Cro-Magnon man. Now, this is an interesting fellow. This is the Britannica Concise Encyclopedia from 2006. It says, a population of anatomically modern Homo sapiens dating from the upper Paleolithic period. So it's a population of anatomically modern Homo sapiens. What does that mean? Meaning their bodies looked identical to our bodies. So they were basically just human beings and that lived on the earth at one time. And you can even notice just from this skull cap, the skull cap on the left looks like the skull cap on the top. Obviously the one on the left doesn't have the jaw connected, but you can see that the tops look basically identical. It just looks a bit older. And so these were nothing more than human beings. And so what about, what about that one that we typically call, you know, we talk about Lucy. 
You know, Lucy. What about Lucy? Well, basically, these are the bones they found of what we have named as Lucy. You give her a name, she, you know, you get a very interesting perspective. But basically, what, notice the skull at the top. And you say, well, I don't really see a skull. No, you just see bone fragments, tiny little, you know, scraps of bone there. And this is what they came up, and they said, this is what that skull looked like. And don't question, just believe it, just like in the textbooks. You're not allowed to actually ask, how could a human being come up with that skull from those scraps of bone? But typically, when we're younger, we just believe it based on faith. But I've come to the point in life where I've realized, maybe they can't. And actually, some of the scientists will say that. There's no way they could come up with that skull from those bones. And so someone honest would say that. But once again, many times we just shouldn't question what we see. That's kind of the perspective. Now, let's move on here, though. Uh, they said, well, one of the proofs that this actually was a, you know, a, a monkey that was actually becoming more human is the fact that it had an angled femur. It has an angled femur. Well, tree climbing monkeys also have an angled femur. That doesn't prove that they're becoming more human. And so they show this again, and you see, you know, Lucy's knee was slightly bigger than an ape's knee. Well, that's true. Lucy's knee was slightly bigger than an ape's knee. But also the bones of a Clydesdale are slightly bigger than a regular horse. That doesn't prove that the Clydesdale is becoming a total different kind of creature. Not at all. Yes, some creatures, some, even some human beings, some groups will have a slightly larger bone structure than another. There's just no question. You go to different countries, actually, when Asians, many of the Asians, when they move over to the Western world, their children go, grow up with an American diet, and their children are are larger than the Asians that would have been back in Asia. In the same way as the American diet, the westernized diet makes its way to the east, the people are actually growing larger. This is not evolution per se, it's, you know, changes with, within a species based upon, you know, whether it's what they're eating or the circumstances around them. Changes take place, there's no question. That does not prove that a creature is becoming a total different kind of being. Now, once again, big horses and small horses still exist today. So you can have a differentiation within a, a species, but that doesn't mean it's becoming a new, kinds of cre new kind of creature. Now, the St. Louis Zoo has Lucy on display with human hands and feet. So, which obviously, when you make these kind of, uh, you know, statues, the imaginary creatures that they like to do in the museums, it's very convincing. Because when you see something like this, you think, wow, it must be true. And since we don't question it because we, we have this idea that there's no bias amongst these individuals, uh, we just trust with implicit faith. But I want to encourage you, the reality is no feet or hands were found, so we don't know if it had the toe separation, like, uh, you know, we humans don't have toe separations, which means I can't climb a tree with my feet like this, but a monkey can grab onto or an ape can grab onto things because they have a toe separation. Uh, but... When we look back on some of the ancient footprints that we see, these are some, they say that these are some of the oldest footprints. Now, I don't believe they're near as old as they say they are. I believe the earth is much younger, but this is what they say. They say these are the oldest footprints. This trail of footprints belonging perhaps to two adults and a child was found preserved in a bed of volcanic ash in Laetoli in Tanzania. It proves that hominids were walking upright some 3.75 million years ago. I don't believe that at all, that it proves that they were walking upright 3.75 million years ago. I don't believe they were around at all at that time. But regardless, let's see what we discover. It says the footprints are described as remarkably similar to those of modern man. The form of the foot was exactly the same as ours. Weight-bearing pressure patterns in the prints resemble human ones. Footprints so very much like our own. Goes on to say, Russell H. Tuttle, University of Chicago, did the most extensive study of the Laetoli footprints as well as studying the footprints of more than 70 habitually barefoot people and found that the 3.5 million year old footprint trails at Laetoli Site G resemble those of habitually unshod modern humans. None of their features suggest that the Laetoli hominids were less capable bipeds than we are. And it says, one more slide, that if the G. Laetoli footprints were not known to be so old, we would readily conclude that they were made by a member of our own genus, Homo. What they're basically saying is, these footprints in the ash are exactly, you can't tell the difference between these footprints, and, and if I were to go walk through, you know, some, you know, a muddy, muddy place, and my footprints would be left behind, it would look identical, other than the fact that they believe that the rocks are so old. Once again, this doesn't prove it. We're going to look more at the dating methods and find out some of the great fallacies behind the dating methods, and we're going to see that when, when they throw out these dates, millions and millions and millions of years ago, or billions of years ago, 
that these, it's not solid like the scientists would have us believe. It's based upon some facts and some guesswork, and in the end, we'll discover that when they know how old something is, when they know for a fact, and when they choose the dating methods, they discover that it doesn't work. When they don't know how the old the dates are, they trust that it must work. We're going to find that as we go forward. So when they took those footprints, the original footprints had no toe separation, but as you can see here in this picture, when they put it in National Geographic, they put a toe separation and made it look more, you know, ape-like. And there it is again, seeing this, you know, monkey woman carrying her little baby in her arms there as they're walking around. Now let's go forward. Evolution's Hall of Shame. Nebraska man, this is one of my favorite of the, the creatures, the ancient ape men. I like this one. He, he's turned out to be a real fun one. But notice with me here. This is Nebraska man. And here he is. I mean, look at this. Look at the picture. Wonderful. He was a hulk of a man. Probably would have done well in professional sports, these kind of things today. But notice Nebraska man and his wife. Notice his wife, as shown in Illustrated London News from 1922. Notice he's got a club there. It, from the picture, it doesn't look like his wife has evolved quite as well as he has. He can walk, and she's still kind of on her haunches. Doesn't seem to be doing as well. Um, I don't know if the idea is man evolved faster than women. I'm not sure. But nevertheless, I, I doubt that. But nevertheless, notice what it says. It was actually scientifically built from what? One tooth. Now, they found one tooth, and they could make this man and his wife out of a tooth. Do you think if someone extracted my tooth, uh, you know, sent it to the Discovery Channel, they could make a creature and my wife what I looked like? Well, they probably could come up with an idea, but it would be nothing like reality. That's a fact. And you say, but Chad, don't you trust them? And the answer is no, I don't. I don't trust human beings when they just come up with all kinds of fanciful theories. The interesting thing, though, is later on, now this Nebraska man, this picture is what they came up with in, to prove that man evolved from monkeys and or ape-like creatures, I should say, if someone wants to be more, you know, correct and accurate or whatever. But the point is this, that they came up with this, but we ended up discovering that that tooth was not the tooth of an ape-like creature. Later on, they discovered that it was none other than the tooth of an extinct pig. It was this tooth of an extinct pig. And so here we have the real Nebraska man. There he is. It looked nothing like what they were imagining. You see, sometimes we trust in the teachings of, of these men. Now, remember, there's good science within science, but when we get into the realms of origins, we get into the aspect of faith, because if you believe something you've never seen, you're believing based upon faith, right? Now, that's according to the biblical concept of what faith is. So there's the real Nebraska man. But... Notice we see here when some of the scientists will be honest about it, they'll say there are not enough fossil records to answer when, where, and how Homo sapiens emerged. Now the Bible tells us that God created man in our own image, that he created him perfect. Now you say, Chad, doesn't that take faith to believe? The answer is absolutely yes, it does. But the question is, does it take faith to believe in these teachings that we've just, we've just seen? And the answer is absolutely yes. To believe these things, you're believing the words of men, not in the Word of God. You're saying, listen, I believe the textbooks, even though time and time again the textbooks have been wrong. But what happens is they put something new out, and it's basically, trust me. Just trust me. Uh, you haven't seen it. You haven't tested it. Just trust me. So are we going to trust in what men write in books, or maybe would we be more likely to trust in what God has shared with men, holy men of old, who spoke as they were moved by the Holy Spirit? God says that he got, gave his message inspired from him, inspired by the Holy Spirit, to men to share with us. So will we trust in the words of human beings who just don't even know, haven't seen these things for themselves? Or maybe the message that God has given to us. Now we're going to change the subject, but not totally. Let's ask the question about racism. What is racism? Well, racism is the belief that all humans or all members of each race possess characteristics or abilities specific to that race, especially so as to distinguish it as inferior or superior to another race or races. So racism is thinking that one race has certain superior gifts than another group of people. Now, uh, racism has typically three elements. It ha racism always involves differences in population groups. Number two, the crucial factor in racism is inherent superiority. And racism always involves prejudice and rejective 
active or passive. So we have these differentiation, we have this differentiation uh, with aspects in racism, but notice the concept that some entities are inherently superior or more fit is basic to evolution. You say, Chad, that's not so. One of the things I find interesting when they republish Darwin's original book, The, D the Origin of the Species, they don't like to really repent it. They like to take out the part that, you know, would be kind of, uh, you know, insulting, and they wouldn't want people to know one of the, maybe be aspects of the original theory of evolution. This is the actual title of the original book. It is the origin of species by means of natural selection or the preservation of favored races in the struggle for life by Charles Darwin. Notice that it seemed to have a racial aspect to it in the very beginning in that book, The Origin of the Species. It was about favored races in the struggle for life. Very interesting. Uh, now, as we notice, speaking of this, it says, speak, this is uh, Darwin himself. He says, I believe in this extreme part of South America, man exists in a lower state of improvement than in any part of the world. He says, I could not have believed how wide was the difference between savage and civilized man. It is greater than between a wild and domesticated animal, inasmuch as in man there is, gr is a greater power of improvement. Very interesting. Now, notice here we have Stephen Jay Gould speaking on this issue of racism. He says, biological arguments for racism may have been common before the 1850, but they increased by orders of magnitude following the acceptance of evolution. What does that mean? What that simply means is this, is that, uh, you know, people may have tried to come up with differences because of, you know, biology and why people were different, why different races were different, but he says it increased by orders of magnitude following this acceptance of evolution. The fittest will survive and the others, well, they're just not going to perpetuate their seeds, so forth. So it had something to do with increasing, you know, the distinction between races, no question. And... Adolf Hitler himself, who was obviously interested in the evolutionary theory and that certain races were truly, truly superior, and he took it to an extreme, obviously, but he himself also said, if you tell a lie long enough, loud enough, and often enough, the people will believe it. And that's the reality. If a lie is told over and over and over, loud enough, often enough, per, you know, perpetuated on the Discovery Channel time and time and time and time and time again, and in the textbooks and in, in uh, you know, periodicals and so forth, sooner or later people start believing it, whether it's true or not. Whether, it has to, whether it's based on faith or whether it's based on actual credible historical science, people end up believing these things. But Malachi in the Bible, the prophet of God in the Bible, had a different perspective from the fact that certain people are inherently superior to other races or certain groups of people are inherently superior. Notice what we read in the Bible. It says, have we not all one father? Hath not one God created us? Why do we deal treacherously every man against his brother by profaning the covenant of our fathers? Have we not all one father? Meaning, didn't we all come from one source? Are we not all brothers and sisters? Why would we hurt one another? Especially for racial issues or for any means, for any reason, for religious reasons or whatever it may be. God isn't intending us to hurt each other, actually to show love, kindness to one another. And we see here that, yes, we see that it's been perpetuated to even a worse degree through people like Hitler. But notice what we also read here in Acts chapter 17, verse 26. And, hath, and God hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on the face of the earth, and hath determined the times before appointed and the bounds of their habitation. We are all of one blood. We all go back to the very same source. Now, what I find interesting is that God's people sometimes, and there's no question, there have been Christians in the past. There have been Jews in the past who've done terrible things. I wouldn't deny that for a second. It's a sad uh, indictment against humanity, but it's not a reality. It doesn't prove anything against Jesus himself. Jesus was a man of kindness, a man of love to people of different racial backgrounds or what have you. So is God. God, you know, causes the sun to shine and the rain to come down upon the just and the unjust. 
God loves all. Have human beings done things that ought not be done? Absolutely. We see an example of this was the man by the name of Saul. Saul himself was a, a, a Jewish man, and he was trying to follow, Ju- follow Judaism, you know, as clearly as possible, but the man was bigoted in his, in his religious teaching, so much so that someone who didn't accept his philosophy, he would actually go out as a group and be there to help them be killed for their belief system in Jesus. This was Saul. Now we know that Saul's later, his experience was that he, he became, his, his life was totally changed. He was changed by Jesus Christ. By, you know, coming in contact with the Savior Jesus Christ, his life was changed. Now I want you to notice what the Encyclopedia Britannica says about him. It says, the Encyclopedia Britannica describes him before his co- conversion as an intolerant, bitter, persecuting, religious bigot, proud and temperamental. After his conversion, he is pictured as patient, kind, enduring, and self-sacrificing. So this man goes from, you know, hating people that are different from him to being kind, patient, actually sacrificing his life for others. I mean, it's amazing the transformation that takes place in his life. 2 Corinthians chapter 11, verse 13 and 14 says, Paul says, For you heard my manner of life when I was in Judaism, that I persecuted the church of God with surpassing zeal and ravaged it. And I progressed in Judaism beyond many contemporaries in my race, being much more a zealot of the tradition of my fathers. He's basically saying, look, I was faithful as a Jew. I persecuted people who didn't believe in our teachings and cling to them as we did. What's fascinating is there were two professors from Oxford University. Now these two professors, uh, one of them was named Lord Littleton and the other was Gilbert West. Now these men were skeptics at Oxford and, and they set out to prove that the Bible was an error. They They both wanted to study and actually prove that the Bible was an inaccurate book of fairy tales, but they were doing it in a strategic manner. They weren't just trying to say it and, you know, come up with this. They wanted to be able to study it and prove it themselves. And so uh, Lord Littleton himself set out to prove that Paul, uh, or Saul rather, never converted to Christianity. He wanted to prove, because what happened, Saul, um, when he became a Christian, when he gave his life to Jesus, his name was later changed to Paul. And he wanted to prove that that never actually happened. It was a sham. Uh, it just wasn't true. And Gilbert West himself uh, set out to prove the fallacy of the resurrection. That's what they did. They set out to prove that the Bible was an error on this point. And as they set out to prove these things, the fascinating thing is they were studying into it for themselves. They both came to the opposite conclusion. That in actuality, Lord Littleton said, you know what, Paul did. When you study history, when you look into these things, Paul did convert to Christianity. When you look into this, he said, there's no question. When when you study into all the facts, it seems a fact that Jesus rose from from the grave, that he died and rose from the grave as he studied into these things. And we read Lord Littleton himself says this, the conversion and apostleship of St. Paul alone, duly considered, was of itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation. Lord Littleton, as he was seeking to destroy the validity of the scriptures, came to the opposite conclusion. And he said the change that took place in this mind, in this man in Paul's life, as he was so transformed being a religious bigot, uh, probably even a racist, all of these things. He was so changed that he went from a man who would persecute people unto death to a man actually who gave his entire life and was actually killed himself for the faith in a man he once persecuted. At least he persecuted his followers. This man was so transformed that his life was changed. And someone like Lord Littleton said, when you, when you understand and look and study his life, this fact, the apostleship of St. Paul, the conversion of him duly considered, duly understood, was of itself a demonstration sufficient to prove Christianity to be a divine revelation. We look at the apostles. I want you to think about this for a minute. Some people sometimes say, they say, you know what? Uh, when you look at the Bible, you, you think about these different people, the Peter and Andrew and the apostles and so forth, the 11, obviously Jews, Judas hung himself. He he was killed by himself anyway at his own hand. But when you look at the 11, many people have made the argument. They said, you know, Jesus didn't really raise from the tomb. You know, Uh, maybe the disciples stole his body away. 
Or maybe the Romans snatched his body out of the tomb. And so, there were, yeah, there was an empty tomb. I mean, that makes sense. The Jews didn't deny that he died. The Jews know the guy lived. There's no question historically Jesus lived. But the question is, did he rise from the tomb? Did he rise from the grave? Well, some say, you know, let's, let's think about this. Now, the Jews didn't like Jesus. So let's say the Jews, not the disciples, but the Jews themselves, let's say they had snatched the body of Jesus away from the tomb. If they had snatched his body away and the disciples came to the tomb and, oh, Nobody's in the tomb. They look inside. There's the, you know, grave clothes and so forth. They look and he's not there. And they say, Jesus rose from the dead. Now, as they begin to proclaim that Jesus rose from the dead and the Jews had dragged his body somewhere else, though the Jews wouldn't have been happy that they were claiming, claiming that Jesus rose from the dead. So you can imagine the Jews would say, no, 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 he didn't raise from the dead. And they'd go find his body where they stuck it and they'd pull it out and they'd parade it through the city on a wheelbarrow or something and say, here's your dead Messiah. He isn't risen from the tomb. So the idea that the Jews stole his body away, that doesn't hold any water. What about the Romans? What about the Roman soldiers? Maybe, maybe the Romans had, had stolen his body away. Now, the Romans didn't like Jesus any more than the Jews, probably. I mean, the Romans were the ones who, I mean, legitimately, physically put him to death. The Romans did. So imagine if, if the, you know, once again, the disciples come to the tomb and, hey, he's not there. Jesus rose from the grave. They proclaim it to everybody. Well, the Romans could drag out his dead body, just like the Jews could have, roll it through the streets on a wheelbarrow and say, here's your dead Messiah. The guy's dead. Don't, don't act like he's still alive. But there's a third option. Others say, but what about... What about, you know, maybe the disciples stole his body away? That's the only other option. But think about this. Many people have said that, but I want you to think about it just for a minute with me. That if, if they stole his body away, that means the disciples knew that they were lying when they said he had risen from the day, dead. Now, let me ask you a question. Many people are willing to die for what they believe to be true, sacrifice their lives. Other people will try to enhance their present life by, by maybe lying, right? Try to get into a better position. But I want you to think about this for a minute. By, if the disciples lied, they knew that Jesus wasn't actually risen from the dead. They would have known. Now, would you want to sacrifice your entire life? Be, I mean, look what happened to the guys. If they knew it, was true, it wasn't true, Peter was crucified for something he knew was a lie. Andrew was crucified for something. Imagine standing firm to the end and saying, no, I believe he died, he died, and I'll let you crucify me for a lie. Come on. I mean, how many, maybe one or two people, but every single one of the living disciples except for one, and he was persecuted also almost to death. Matthew was killed with the sword. John is the only one of the 11 that died of natural cause but he was put in a, a vat of boiling oil. He was tormented for his faith in something he knew to be true, not something he was lying about or something he knew to be a lie. Why would they sacrifice their existence, give up on all uh, you know, financial luxuries of this world? They believed in totality in what they believed. Some will die for, for a lie, yes, but not for a lie they know to be true. These men believed with all their heart in the Savior, Jesus Christ. Uh, James, the son of Alphaeus, was crucified. Philip was crucified, and so was Simon. Thaddeus was killed by arrows. James, the brother of Jesus, was stoned. We move on. Thomas was killed with a spear thrust. Bartholomew was crucified. And James, the son of Zebedee, was killed with the sword. These men, the only option is they knew Jesus didn't die. And the fact is, why would they all be willing to die for a faith they knew was not true? The fact is, they had seen the resurrected Lord. They would not die, all of them, for a lie, but they were faithful to something they knew to be true. Paul himself had come in contact with the resurrected Christ. His life was changed. His life was changed by Jesus himself. And Thomas, Thomas who once had been a doubter, Thomas himself went from being a doubter to being so transformed that he, he went off. He once had been a skeptic of the resurrection of Jesus, but after coming in contact with the resurrected Jesus, he was so changed, he was so transformed that he went off into India and he was killed by a spear thrust for his Savior, Jesus Christ. Friends, Jesus died on the cross. He not only died, many Jews have died on the cross. Many people, many Romans, many others have died on the cross. But Jesus himself had done no sin. And he is willing to, he took all of our sins to the cross. And he offers us eternal life in place of our sinful, sinful life. And he calls us, he says, will you walk with me? You may have been a doubter, but Jesus, there's ample reason to believe. And we're going to look at other reasons to believe in the scriptures. God has given us reasons to believe. And I want to challenge you to pick up the book. 
pick up the Bible. Study these things out for yourself. Don't just trust in the words of man. God has spoke through holy men with His Holy Spirit. He has shared with us a, a book that is from, in essence, that it is a message spoken by God to holy men of old. And I want to challenge you to pick up the book. Read it for yourself. But let us close with a prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much that you have given us a life-changing, transforming book. Yes, we see time and again that many of the things that have been spoken of in history within science have been just dishonest. Some have been accidental mistakes. But the reality is, yes, we know that there is truth within some of science. Much of science, uh, you know, so forth, health sciences, even earth science, and these different kind of things is wonderful truth. But we also realize man has gotten into philosophy with a purpose to disprove you. And tried to kind of piggyback that onto science. And it's nothing more than faith in the teachings of man. But Father, you've given us something that is much more than just an... It is an accurate portrayal of the creation of this world. But it is much more than that. It is a revelation of a Savior who came to this earth to die for our sins. And he came that we would be set free. And we once and we in the future can live eternally with him. Father, we thank you for your love. In the name of Jesus, amen.